Welcome to Anti-Tank Chats. In this series, we will take you through the history of infantry anti-tank weapons. In this episode, we will be looking at the arrival of the Shape Charge Launcher, and specifically the United States Army's development of the bazooka. Please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. For the US, infantry anti-tank weapons had, like most other nations, not been given a high priority during the interwar period. And the initial focus was for the US Army was on automatic weapons like the M2 50 cal machine gun, introduced in service in 1933, for their anti-tank capability. Time in this situation is more important than an ideal gun position. In a few seconds, the gun is in position, ready to fire up the road when the cars appear. The gun is a relatively small, obscure target. The element of surprise is now with the 50 caliber gun. The gun opens fire on the leading car, using one round of tracer to each three or four rounds of armor-piercing ammunition. Thus, the gun is easily kept on the target. It was quickly realized that larger caliber round in the form of a .6 caliber and later a .9 caliber anti-tank rifle would be more effective in this dedicated role. And the purchase of a couple of 20 mm Solothurn rifles in 1939 showed the way that US military thinking was heading. However, the weight and maneuverability of these anti-tank rifles became an issue and the US entered World War II without its own manufactured anti-tank rifle, although some ranger units used the boys. Simultaneously, other solutions have started to be explored, and the bazooka's origins really comes down to the evolution and marrying of two distinct developments, the shape charge warhead and solid rocket propulsion. In 1888, Charles Monroe, whilst working for the US, US Navy on underwater explosive devices, independently discovered that a cavity, in this case using a hollow tin can, would, if surrounded by sticks of dynamite, concentrate the explosive charge in a focused direction allowing the course of a particular experiment to penetrate a safe. What became known in the UK and US as the Monroe effect demonstrated that the hollow charge concept could penetrate steel. Further military enhancements to the shape charge concept have been perfected in the mid-1930s. An example of was supplied to the US Army Ordnance Department and trials followed in December 1940. The result was the creation of the special rifle grenade, M9, which was fired from a device attached to the end of a rifle barrel using a specially designed blank cartridge. This is the most powerful weapon you carry. It makes you a walking arsenal. It weighs one and a quarter pounds, and it'll do a go-to-hell job on any light or medium tank. The M9 entered service with US forces in January 1941, but it was deemed secret, so training and usage of it were highly restricted. However, its main drawbacks was a lack of armour penetration. 32 millimetres of armour at a time when armour of tanks was being increased. This meant that until the arrival of an improved handheld anti-tank weapon, the US infantry would have to rely on the M9A1 rifle grenade for its close-in tank defence. But remember, whenever you can, hold your fire. Wait till the tank is smack up on you. Now, give it to them. Initially, work on increasing the armour penetration of the rifle grenade looked promising. With a new design, the M10 High Explosive Anti-Tank Grenade, capable of defeating 50 millimetres of armour. However, this grenade, accepted in late November 1941, also had a drawback, its size, being deemed too large to be launched from a rifle, as it would damage it. Other options were examined, such as a dedicated launcher, but it was Gregory Kissinich, Chief of the Ordnance Pattern Section, who in a serendipitous moment discovered that new developments in rocket propulsion could provide the solution to the M10 grenade's launching problems. It's the next two stages which become key to creation of the bazooka concept, the propellant and the launcher. Initially, spigot mortars were trialled in an attempt to identify a suitable launcher, but this did not produce the required accuracy level. However, it was discovered that if the formulation of the propellant itself was changed, so it had a faster burn time, then a projectile could be launched from a long tube, allowing the rocket motor to burn out before ex exiting, increasing its accuracy and also helping to reduce any propellant scorching to the operator. 
developments now accelerate by creating a working model by using a scrap section of metal tube five foot long, adding wooden hand grips, a shoulder stock and rigging up an electrical trigger system using a battery. It was this device which you all demonstrated at Aberdeen Proving Ground in May 1942 to the assembled delegates that the launcher could hit a moving M3 medium tank whilst other spigot based weapons were unable to achieve this. Apparently Lieutenant General McNair, commander of Army Ground Forces, liked what he saw and asked to fire the weapon himself. Leading General Barnes, Chief of the Ordnance Technical Staff, who also fired a rocket, to later comment that the launcher resembled the bazooka musical instrument invented and played by Bob Burns, a radio and musical comedian. Further demonstrations confirmed the bazooka's success, and on May the 20th, 1942, General Electric's plant at Bridgeport, Connecticut was awarded the contract for the manufacture of 5,000 of the newly named T1 launchers, codenamed WIP, with the E.G. Budd Company, Philadelphia, given the contract to produce 25,000 rockets. After reputedly working through 14 different launcher designs and various improvements to the T1 rockets, on the 24th of June 1942, the T1 was officially type classified as the 2.36 inch M1 anti-tank rocket launcher and the M6 heat rocket. The age of the bazooka had arrived. Now, whilst we don't have an M1 bazooka in the collection, we do have an example of the M9A1, which I have here. The M9A1 shares the same caliber as its predecessors, 2.36 inch, but differs from the M1 and the M1A1 designs in a number of ways. Firstly, the steel tube is approximately seven inches longer, 61 inches providing more accuracy and range compared to the M1, but the fact that it's in, split into two sections, which is most noticeable. This section design had been requested by the US Airborne Command in November 1942, who wanted to equip their airborne units with a folding bazooka, having realized that in its present form, it was too cumbersome for jumps. This requirement led to the M9 model, but concerns with regard to the fragility of the three lug interrupted coupling and its ability to survive jumps without being distorted and thus being successfully assembled and deployed led to the present forge coupling, which can be seen here on the M9A1 model. The modification meant that the M9 and M9A1 were not compatible for coupling, but were otherwise the same. Now, in order to operate the M9A1, we need to fit both barrel sections together. First, we need to disengage the sections using the barrel latch handle, which releases the barrel latch. Next, we need to lock the two barrel sections into place. We do this by depressing the barrel coupling lock lever here, twisting the three lugs into place and releasing the lever, locking the barrel and rear barrel sections together. At the front, we have the conical muzzle flash deflector, designed to deflect occasional particles of unburned powder from hitting the fire's face. Now, if you look at the rear, section of the barrel, you can still see steel wire wrapped around it from the site to the contact spring. This was initially introduced as a safety upgrade in the spring of 1943 with late M1s and the M1A1 to reinforce the barrel after a number of incidents involving premature rocket detonations. The end of the barrel is protected by an outsized guard frame. By the way, the welding marks you can see are the result of its deactivation. A two-stepped metal strapped shoulder stock replaced the wooden one used on the earlier M1 with a T90 optical reflecting ring sight located on the left. The T90 sight replaced the earlier T43 folding bar sight and consequently did away with the requirement for a front sight. The T90 was fitted to launchers from October 1944 onwards. The range scale here is marked in 50 yard increments, up to 600 yards, with the effective range of the M9A1 really being about 300 yards. The T90 site also has internal graphical markings, with circular ones being used to estimate lead for moving targets. Looking at the electrical firing setup, there's a plastic hand grip featuring an integral safety switch. Down for safe, up for fire. In the earlier M1 models, the wooden shoulder stock would have contained a set of batteries. Problems with batteries operating at low temperatures meant that for the M9A1, the batteries were replaced with a magneto, internally located in the hand grip, held in place by two screws. When the fire squeezed the trigger, the activated magneto would generate the electrical current to ignite the rocket. In normal circumstances, 
The bazooka was a two-man crude weapon with a loader and a firer. The loading procedure would be as follows. With the safety on safe, the firer aims at the target, whether standing, kneeling or prone. Taking a rocket, the loader carefully grips it by the rocket's motor tube. He then depresses the spring-loaded contact latch, releasing the latch once the head of the rocket has been inserted into the barrel. He then removes the rocket's safety pin, depressing the contact so the rocket can be fully inserted until the latch lines up with the notch on the rocket's fins. The loader then uncoils the wire, trailing off the fins and attaches to the coils. The launcher is now ready to be fired. The position of the loader in this process is crucial to their safety, as the manual makes clear. During the operation of loading, sighting and firing, the loader should at no time stand directly behind the launcher. To fire the rocket, the firer moves the safety switch to fire and squeezes the trigger, releasing it immediately and making sure that he maintains it on target until the rocket has launched. Taking a closer look at the rocket using this M6A3 bazooka example, you can see it has a round shaped nose which lowered the angle of impact to 60 degrees. The M6A1 rocket had a pointed nose. The solid rocket repellent is located here and the barrel tail fins would notch here. An electrical igniter wire protrudes from the rear and will be coiled around one of the contacts. For a complete 2.36 inch round, the weight would be approximately 3.4 pounds. Muzzle velocity would be around 265 feet per second with a maximum range of 700 yards, although effective range was realistically out to 300 yards. Using this M6A6 section example, you can see from its construction that the warhead is manufactured from thin press sheet steel. The explosive cone space cavity is clearly visible here with a two millimeter copper liner. Liner thickness, shape and material choice was and is crucial. The change from a steel to a copper liner increased penetration by around 30%, allowing up to five inches, 127 millimeters of armor to be penetrated. Above the explosives is located the impact on non-delay base detonated fuse located here. So as the war hit, hits the target, the fuse is immediately initiated by the impact traveling through the walls detonating the explosive. This in turn creates a high pressure wire, shock wave, which collapses the liner into a hypersonic jet, forming to around two kilometers per second, accelerating to around 10, the tip of the jet traveling far faster than the tail as it is more time to form. The metal liner essentially resembles a fluid rather than a solid and heats up to around 800 plus degrees Celsius during the process. Metal fragments for the projectile could also hit the crew behind the penetrated armor and also ignite ammunition and fuel. Here you can see the copper slug or carrot of a formed jet giving a good idea of how the size and shape of the liner impacts on its formation. In basic terms, the hold shape charge process is designed to direct and concentrate energy in the axial direction creating a deep cavity or penetration, but it requires a specific standoff distance to allow the jet to form properly. Too near and the jet won't have time to form, too far away and the jet will disperse its energy. This means that the initiating distance for the optimum deployment of shaped charge weapons, regardless of the firing or placement method, is crucial to its destructive effectiveness. The success of the bazooka as an anti-tank weapon can be seen by the production numbers. If we count all 2.36 inch bazookas from the M1 to the M18, approximately 476,728 were produced by the war's end with over 58%, 277,819 being the M9A1 model. The last refinement of the 2.36 inch launcher model was the M18, but this only saw limited numbers, 500 being produced before it was canceled due to the war ending. The key feature of the M18 was the reduction in weight it offered over the M9A1, 5.57 pounds, which was due to its aluminium construction. Other developments saw trials in 1943 of 3.25 inch launchers, the T-16 and T-24, aimed at providing an increase in penetration, but these designs were not pursued. However, increases in armour protection, especially the use of sloped armour on tanks such as the Panther, led to work on the T-74, a 3.5 inch aluminium model that could penetrate thicker armour, reputedly upwards of 11 inches, which is 280 millimetres. 
This model, the M20, would become available in October 1945, but wouldn't see full production and widespread use until the poor performance of the 2.3 six-inch bazookas against North Korean T-34-85s in 1950. In contrast, the Super Bazooka, or 3.5, gave infantry the capability of overmatching sloped armour. In addition, different types of rocket were produced, including practice rockets, WP, white phosphorus, and HC, smoke round, for target marking and screening. A chemical rocket, M26, was developed and filled with cyanogen chloride, but never used in action. In terms of combat use, the bazooka made its debut for the US Army during the torch landings of early November 1942, with the Renault FT-17 appearing to be the first recorded vehicle casualty. Previous to this, British and Soviet forces had been the first to receive bazookas, but the British stored their launcher allotment in the belief that the bazooka wasn't suitable for desert fighting, deciding it was difficult to conceal. The Soviet Army also appears to have had its concerns regarding the bazooka, such as concealment, backblast, and its less effective performance in colder temperatures, and favoured sticking with its anti-tank rifles. Initial success with the bazooka appears to have been patchy in Tunisia, in the main due to a lack of specific training and the decision not to have dedicated crews. But by the time the landings in Sicily and Salerno had taken place, the bazooka's reputation as an effective defensive weapon had been made. Its use in Normandy from D-Day onwards, and especially its employment in the Bukars country, where it was seen as much more capable than the 57mm anti-tank gun, which was viewed as unwieldy, also saw it as being used in an offensive role against German strongpoints, such as pillboxes and bunkers. It gave the infantry another direct fire weapon. The bazooka proved valuable to infantry and airborne units in the Ardennes, with nine times as many rockets being fired than in June 1944. I'll never forget that old lieutenant running into the field kitchen and hollering at me if and I had any idea how to operate a bazooka. I said no, and he said, well, you're going to learn now, son. I did, and I'll be doggone if in the first shot out the barrel I didn't get me a Jerry Tank. Got interviewed later by Stars and Stripes. They said it was a crackerjack story. But the thicker sloped armour of the Panther and King Tiger started to show the 2.36 inch bazooka's limitations, with track and flanking shots being the only real options of obtaining a hit. Also the wintry weather, the cold, was reported as having an adverse effect on the batteries of the earlier models. They were allotted to the Pacific theatre, but there was less requirement for it due to the lack of Japanese armour threat. Initially, bazookas were allotted through to a rifle company, but this changed in February 1944, with the addition of five more, bringing the total to eight in each rifle company, and dedicated crews were then allotted. An M6 canvas bag held three rockets each, and three bags were carried per bazooka. The invention of the bazooka gave the US foot soldier a standoff weapon with an effective anti-tank capability for the first time. It was relatively easy to learn how to operate it. It was transportable and able to be concealed. Its arrival on the battlefield provided the infantry with a direct fire weapon to be used against mass tank attacks. 4.5% of German tank losses were attributed to the bazooka and in offensive roles against strong points. Of course, there were drawbacks. The bazooka's limited calibre meant it was outdated by the end of 1944 against tanks using sloped armour and the need to expose the operator to fire the weapons means that it was vulnerable to infantry and artillery fire, not to mention the problems of backblast. But even when hits didn't penetrate thicker armour, or it didn't ignite, the bazooka offered the infantry a tangible upgrade on the anti-tank rifle and the anti-tank grenade during 1943 and 1944, and one that they were grateful to have. Take cover! Bring up the pit! In the next episode, we will look at the British development of the spigot fixed shaped charge and in the form of the projector infantry anti-tank or the PIAT. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please support the Tank Museum by subscribing on YouTube and supporting us through Patreon.